Renaissance humanism has shaped the way we think and what we do. Our education, our cultural world, the literature we read, the plays we watch, the music we listen to, our religion, politics and philosophy, the very language we speak. To hear the poetry of Milton, Shakespeare or Spencer, or to read the prose of Erasmus, Thomas More, or the words of a Tyndale Bible, for instance, is to encounter language that has been shaped by the humanist ideas and assumptions that have permeated the Western world. So it is with humanism, a phenomenon that transformed the study of literature in Renaissance Europe and has left its imprint on society today. The Studia Humanitatis, a discipline embracing grammar, rhetoric, poetry, moral philosophy and history, involved the study of classical literature and languages, philology and the art of debate. It gave birth to a new age of eloquence in which education and literature, as well as the way in which philosophy and theology were expressed, changed forever. Humanism revolutionised European culture by means of relating to its classical literary past. The term humanitas is still employed in almost every university in the world in the form of the word humanities. Humanism revolutionised European culture by means of relating to its classical literary past. The term humanitas is still employed in almost every university in the world in the form of the word humanities. Renaissance humanism is not the same as secular humanism of the 21st century. So what is it? Any attempt to give a working definition of humanism is always a precarious venture, but it must be done. In fact, the term humanism is not a term from the Renaissance at all, but was developed in the 19th century from the Latin humanitas, as used by Cicero in classical times, and those humanista of the 15th century who studied and taught the humani literae, liberal arts in the universities. As James Hankins has observed, it was George Voigt who first used the word humanism to refer to the Renaissance study of classical texts and languages. In the same century, a philosophical sense of humanism was developed in the work of Ludwig Feuerbach, leading eventually to the common understanding of the term humanism in modern society as a secular philosophy of humankind. However, any notion of Renaissance humanism as a philosophy of man was largely discredited by Paul Christella, who cogently argued that Renaissance humanism is best seen as, at quote, a movement rooted in the medieval rhetorical tradition to revive the language and literature of classical antiquity. Humanists were not philosophers, but men and women of letters, end quote. As for the origins of humanism, we have to look to what is known as the Trecento and Quattrocento in Italy. It was here that humanism emerged through the 13th and 14th centuries in the works of Italian scholars, such as Lovato de Olivati, Montagnoni, Piazzolla and Musato. Most of the early humanists were lawyers and of the Paduans, Musato became the most widely renowned. The humanist Paduans were basically secular and civic in their outlook, not least Masato, whose writings demonstrated no special religious interest until he converted to Christianity late in life. The term humanist in the Latin humanista or Italian humanista was used in the 15th century. However, as Louis Spitz points out, the term did not travel outside of Italy until the early 16th century appearing in Germany in the Latin text of the Epistolae Obscurorum Virorum in 1515. The term made its way also to France by the mid-16th century, to England by the late 16th century, and the German word humanismus was in use at the end of the 18th century, so that by 1809 humanism stood for devotion to the literature of ancient Greece and Rome and the humane values that may be derived from them. These literati, poetae, or oratores, were often prominent figures in Italian society. Such university teachers, political secretaries, or other officials and poets, they all specialised in language. 
this new Greco-Roman-inspired culture placed great emphasis on the Studia Humanitatis, which tended to involve the study of classical literature and languages, along with the rhetorical arts, such as debating skills, philology, and the eloquent use of language. Other terms used to describe their pursuits were Studia Humaniora, more humane studies, Studia Honestarum, Artium, the study of honourable arts, Bonae Literae, good letters, Bonae Artes, the good arts, Eruditio Legitima et Ingenua, noble and legitimate learning. The aim of these humanist pursuits, occupying a central space between the practical studies of law, medicine or the mechanical arts, and more theoretical occupations, such as natural philosophy, metaphysics and theology, was therefore to improve individual and corporate wisdom, piety and eloquence. As James Hankins says, the scope of the humane studies was to improve the quality of human beings qua human. The humanists claimed the study of good letters made people better, more virtuous, wiser and more eloquent. It made them worthy to exercise power and made them better citizens and subjects when not exercising power. Humane studies embellished life, brought pleasure and nourished piety. The humanities did not save souls, but living a good life would bring men favour in the eyes of God and strengthen piety, or at least not damage it. The fundamental assumption of all humanists as of the Renaissance movement in general, was that the remains of classical antiquity constituted a great reservoir of excellence, literary, intellectual, artistic and moral, to which debased and decadent modern times could turn in order to repair the damage brought by the barbaric and corrupt medium avum, Middle Ages, that had followed the fall of the Roman Empire." End quote. One thing humanism was not was new learning, a term that has been incorrectly used in connection with Renaissance humanism. The phrase new learning was employed in the 16th century, but only as a pejorative sense, as to quote Dermot McCulloch, an abusive Catholic term for Protestant or evangelical theology that is by no means the same as humanism, end quote. Nor can we simply equate humanism with philosophy and theology. Humanists tended to extol moral philosophy at the expense of metaphysics, psychology and natural philosophy, which they largely ignored. Of the seven parts of the medieval arts curriculum, known as the Septennium, consisting of the Trivium, Grammar, Rhetoric and Dialectics, and the Quadrivium, Arithmetic, Geometry, Music and Astronomy, the Trivium was more attractive to the humanists. Rhetoric was preferred to logic, dialogue preferred to analysis, philology, the love of words, in preference to philosophical substance. Eloquence was more important than powerful thought. Nevertheless, humanism, in its insistence upon eloquent expression and civilised self-improvement, served philosophy and theology well. Although the Studia Humanitatis had developed from the so-called Ars Dictaminis, the medieval rhetorical tradition, and those who taught the subject, the dictatores, were largely interested in secular issues and rarely addressed Christian themes. The Christian branch of humanism, which developed north of the Alps, nevertheless encouraged the appreciation and study of languages, such as Hebrew, Greek and Latin. These languages were considered to be important in allowing for a proper understanding of the Christian texts, scripture and patristic writings, which were consequently subjected to scholarly and philological treatment by humanists. So Christian humanists were particularly concerned with church reform, the provision of an incorrupt, educated clergy and a preaching ministry. <laughs> 